14. So the Word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. We, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and, one and only Son. This third candle of Advent. <laughs> symbolizes love. The whole meaning of Christmas can be explained in one word, love. God sent his gift of pure love to us that first Christmas. Love descended from heaven to be born of a virgin. Love lay in a scratchy hay of manger in a meager barn in Bethlehem. All of God's love was robed in a delicate skin of a baby and wrapped in swaddling clothes. This final week of Advent help us reflect on the magnitude of love that was made manifest in Jesus. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. 1 John 4.10 says, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Father, this week of Advent, fill our hearts and minds with the significance of the truth of your love. We have learned to love from being loved by you. And so today, let us live that love. We know that what the world needs now, this Christmas, is more love. Help us daily to remember how much you love each one of us and help us to see the opportunities to share that love with others. Thank you, Lord, for loving us enough to send Jesus. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, one of my favorite teachers of all things philosophical, ethical, and moral is a guy by the name of Theodore Giselle. Now, you probably know him by the name Dr. Seuss. Now, I don't know if Dr. Seuss has an MD or a PhD, but he's apparently a doctor or something out there. Hey, I wanted to share with you this, uh, this book. I'm sure many of you have seen it. it it's called Horton Hears a Who, and, and I thought we would take a look at it this morning as we uh, dive into God's Word. It says, On the 15th of May, in the jungle of Newell, in the heat of the day, in the cool of the pool, he was splashing enjoying the jungle's great joys when Horton the elephant heard a small noise. So Horton stopped splashing. He looked toward the sound. That's funny, thought Horton. There's no one around. Then he heard it again, just a faint yelp, as if some tiny person were calling for help. I'll help you, said Horton, but who are you? Where? He looked and he looked. He could see nothing there, but a small speck of dust blowing past through the air. I say, murmured Horton, I've never heard tell of a small speck of dust that is able to yell. So you know what I think? Why I think they're that there must be someone on top of that small speck of dust. Some sort of a creature of very small size, too small to be seen by an elephant's eyes. Some poor little person who's shaking with fear that he'll blow in the pool, he has no way to steer. I'll just have to save him because after all, a person's a person, no matter how small. Now let me ask you, what if there really were people out there that lived on a speck that we couldn't see, but they actually needed our help. Just because we can't see them or, or hear them or feel them doesn't mean they aren't out there and they don't need our help today. Listen, this morning we're continuing our series on Advent, and we've been talking about those big themes of Advent, right? There's hope and peace, and today I want to talk about love. One of the most famous Christmas carols is Silent Night. Silent night, holy night, and in the second verse of Silent Night, there is the line that says, Son of God loves pure light. I heard about a six-year-old that thought, I wonder why Jesus loves pure light so much. I don't know why, but I have this vision of Jesus on a tanning bed with, you know, the mirror thing. Like, why does Jesus love light? Oh, I love the light, right? Anyway, that we know it, that is not what it means. Jesus is that pure light, and and he is the embodiment of love, right? Um, 
In John's gospel, if you read John's gospel, it has a Christmas story in John chapter 1. Now, I don't recommend you reading John's Christmas story on Christmas morning because it's not as good. It doesn't have shepherds and angels and a manger and animals. Like, the kids really aren't going to love John's Christmas story. But John's Christmas story tells the story of Jesus coming into the world. And John sums it up in chapter 1, verse 14, where he says this. So the Word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So how do we live in and live out that unfailing love that John is talking about as Jesus came into the world this Christmas? How do we live that out? The Bible, in the Bible, one time Jesus was asked to sum up uh, basically all of the Christian faith. He was actually asked how, about eternity, like how do you get eternal life, right? And Jesus, they said, hey, boil it down for me, Jesus. Sum it up. What does that mean? What do I have to do to be saved? And we see that Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. In Luke chapter 10, we see this story, and I want you to read it along with me. If you've got your Bible, open it to Luke chapter 10, verse 25. It says this. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, well, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and then love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Simple, huh? Love God, love your neighbor. Like, that's it. That's all there is. Period. End of sentence. Mic drop. In fact, in my mind, I sometimes picture, I wonder if Jesus was already walking away at this point when the guy says, whoa, 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 Jesus, hold up a second. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? It's a funny question, really. If you think about it, it's got this underlying assumption, this weird underlying assumption, right? And the underlying assumption is this. Not everyone's my neighbor, right? I mean, there's got to be someone who's not my neighbor, right? Who do I get to ignore? Who do I not have to love, Jesus? That's what he's asking. That's the underlying assumption. And Jesus answers with a story. Now, you know this story. It's a, it's a famous story, right? And it takes on a little bit more significance when you understand that it was the answer to this question of who is my neighbor. So let's jump into that. It's in Luke chapter 10, continuing on there in verse 30. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. Now, by chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan, don't miss that, came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds and, with olive oil and wine and bandaged him. Then he put the man on his own donkey and he took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. And if his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. This is the story of the good Muslim. I mean, I mean, no, this is the story of the good socialist. No, no, no. This is the story of the good Raiders fan, right? It's the story of the Good Samaritan is how we know it. But what you need to think through is, how do you think through this, right? This is somebody who is so different, so opposed to your way of life that you have a hard time even imagining them being good. That's who is the good, that's the good guy in the story, honestly. 
He was the guy who helped the guy who beat him up. Listen, there's only two people in this story who could be considered neighbors. There's the guy who got beat up and beat down, right? The one in need, and then there's the one who showed mercy. This, there was the person who needs kindness, and then there was the person who showed the kindness, right? Now, these guys weren't from the same region. One of them was Jewish. One of them was a Samaritan. They didn't live in the same neighborhood. Their kids didn't go to the same schools. Nobody had ever borrowed a lawnmower or a ladder. Nobody had ever uh, gone over next door to get an egg or a cup of sugar. That had never happened, right? But Jesus says these two were neighbors, right? Listen, this Samaritan simply saw someone who was in need, someone who was hurting, and he stopped. He got off his donkey and he did something about it right listen this isn't rocket surgery this is this is just easy peasy rice and cheesy uh this is a neighborly action when you see someone in need and you do something about it i'm gonna tell you something crazy horton hears a who when you stop and think about it is really the story of the good samaritan right there's an elephant he's walking along, minding his own business, right, in the jungle of Newell, and he hears a call for help. And then he answers it. It says, through the high jungle treetops, the news quickly spread. He talks to a dust speck. He's out of his head. Just look at him walk with that speck on a flower. And Horton walked, worrying, almost an hour. Should I put this speck down, Horton thought with alarm. If I do, these small persons might come to great harm. I can't put it down, and I won't, after all. A person's a person, no matter how small. How do we love our neighbor, no matter who they are? Whenever we see someone in need, no matter how big or small. How do we shine love's pure light, Jesus' love, into those places? And the simple question is how? And the answer is really easy. It's do something. You got to do something. You can't just walk by. You got to do something. There's another passage in Matthew chapter 25 where Jesus talks about the importance of doing something. And it says this in Matthew 25, verse 34 through 40, if you've got to pull it up uh, in your Bible. Then the king will say to those on his right, he separated the, the, the sheep and the goat from the right and the left, and he says to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father on the right. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will say, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing when did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you and the king will say i tell you the truth when you did it for one of the least of these my brothers and sisters you are doing it to me i don't know if it makes anyone else uncomfortable but it sort of makes me uncomfortable how often jesus ties eternity to this stuff Right Now, I believe we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, but honestly, we've got some pretty heavy responsibility in Jesus' own words to do something for the least of these, to take care of those people that God puts in our path. Listen, you don't need to start an international aid organization. That's not what we're talking about here, right? You just need to react to the need in front of you. Maybe it's just one need, right? You don't have to save every speck on every clover, but you have to save the speck on the clover that's in front of you. Listen, you don't have to wipe out world hunger, but you can feed the one hungry person that is in front of you. You can't take everyone into your home, but maybe you can take one person into your home. You can't clothe everyone who's cold this winter, but you probably could buy one coat for someone who is cold. You can't get a gift for every orphan or foster kid out there, but you could probably adopt one kid and give him a gift that would make a difference. You can't care for everyone who's sick, but you can care for one sick person. You can't visit every prisoner, but you could visit one prisoner. Mother Teresa has a quote that has always stuck with me. It says this, 
If I look at the mass, I will never act. But if I look at the one, I will. In Matthew chapter 10, we see this line and it says, And if you give even a cup of cold water to one of these, the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. Listen, this Christmas, as you're thinking about how to help, maybe you can't write a $100,000 check to Advent Conspiracy. But maybe you can write a $100 check. Maybe you can't write a $100 check because you just can't. But you could write a $10 check. Maybe you can't write a check at all because you don't even know what a check is. Listen, kids, before there was Venmo, people would have little pieces of paper the bank gave them and you would sign your name. Never mind, I'll explain it later. You can text to give for Advent Conspiracy. But honestly, you can do something. Which leads me to... So what? Thank you, Augusto. So what? Well, let's go back to Horton Here's a Who, shall we? As we're getting near the end, Horton's facing some persecution. It says, grab him, they shouted. He's been trying to help these people and cage the big dope. Lasso his stomach with ten miles of rope. Tie the knots tight so he'll never shake loose. Then dunk that dumb speck in the bezel nut juice. Man, I could be a great poet if I could just make up words whenever I wanted to. Horton fought back with great vigor and vim, but the Wickersham gang was too many for him. They beat him, they mauled him. This is a kid's book. They started to haul him into his cage, but he managed to call to the mayor, don't give up, I believe in you all. A person's a person, no matter how small. And you very small persons will not have to die if you make yourselves heard, so come on now and try. Listen, I used to think that there were no people living on a speck that I had never seen or never heard from before. And then I went to staff meeting one Tuesday. And John Ramey from Aslan f called somebody on the phone. Listen to this. Hi, everybody. This is John from India. Thank you, John. Uh, it's, it's a nice time to talk with you all, and it's a great opportunity for me to talk with you all. Uh, you know, you must have heard about India, and India since uh, 2016, the persecution against uh, Christian, it's a uh, uh, increased day by day, day by day, physical persecution, spiritual persecution, and financial persecution too. Like physical persecution, the, the people of many other religions, especially the Hindu mob, they attack physically and in many times they attack me and my team many of many of my disciples they they have killed and they kidnap their children they kidnap their uh, young daughters teenagers and little children last year maybe uh, i have said with my daddy john that last year one of my missionary daughter has been kidnapped she is six years old so they kidnapped and last year also in mumbai one of the uh, one of our missionaries they killed uh, and a uh, uh, few of uh, around in one village 400 people they tried to kill me and my family one day we were in the uh, care group prayer and we pray for one family and suddenly a mob come around 400 people they come around and they attacked us and they uh, they dragged me to the temple and they told me uh, to worship the idols then i i suddenly the holy spirit guide me and i shouted for me to live is christ and to die is gain as philippians chapter 1 verse 21 says for me to live is christ and to die is gain so i'm i'm ready to die i told the uh, uh, priest i'm ready to die if you want to kill me you can kill me you can kill my family but every drop of our blood will be will be a new church in this city. So in this way, every day we are facing a lot of persecution. Now I know about John from India, right? Now I know the persecution he and the people in his network are under. Now I have a responsibility to act, right? Before this, John was living on a speck, on a clover that I had never heard or seen and knew nothing about. But now he's a real person. And I can do something or I can keep playing in the pool in the jungle of Newell, right? I can talk about love's pure light 
or I can live out love's pure light. Listen, the true meaning of Christmas is love. That's what it is. That's what it's always been. It's love that literally came down from heaven, put on human flesh, was born of a virgin, and lived out love and walked among us. Even those that would reject the claims of Jesus, even those that would say it's not true, if you ask them, what is the meaning of Christmas? Why is Christmas so special? What would they answer? Is it the gifts? Is it the decorations? I mean, what makes this time so different during the year than any other time of the year? And the truth of the matter is it's love. We travel home to spend time with the people we love. We give gifts as an expression of love. And I want to make sure that we understand this because we can love people that are half a planet away in India. But let me bring this home a little closer because we can do something right in our world close. I have a great story in my files that was written by a kid who tells the story of his first grandmother, his first adventure with grandma. He talks about his adventures with grandma, right? And he says he remembers riding to grandma's house when his big sister dropped the bomb on him. There is no Santa Claus. She said, even dummies know that. He thought to himself, you know, my grandmother's not the gushy kind. She always tells the truth. She'll give it to me straight, right? And so she goes, to, he says, I'm going to go over to grandma's and find out. Not to mention, grandma had the most world famous cinnamon buns, and he knew he would get one of those while he was over there, right? So grandma was home, and he comes in, and he, the buns were still warm, which is perfect, and he asks grandma, what is this about no Santa Claus? And grandma says, no Santa Claus? Well, that rumor's been circulating for, for years. It's ridiculous. Don't believe it. It makes me mad. In fact, it makes me plain mad. Now, go get your coat and let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I just got here. I want my second cinnamon bun, right? Where? Well, where turned out to be Kirby's General Store. This was a long time ago, and the general store was a place where you could get a little bit of anything at the general store. And Grandma sat out in the car, handed him a $10 bill, and said, you take this $10 and go into that store, and you buy something for someone who needs it. He was eight years old at the time. He walks into this store, and he says, I've been shopping before with my mom, but I had never shopped by myself. I had $10, which was a fortune to me at that time. I didn't know what to buy. I didn't know for who or what I was going to do with it. He says, I thought of everybody I could think of. I thought of uh, family. I thought of my, my friends. I thought of uh, the kids at school. I thought of people at church. I thought of my neighbors. And he goes, and I couldn't come up with anything until Bobby Decker popped into my mind. Now, Bobby Decker, how he's had messed up hair and really bad breath, and he sat just behind me in second grade. And Bobby Decker didn't have a coat. Now, during the winter months, Bobby Decker's mom would send a note saying, Bobby can't come out to play at recess because he's got a cough. But we all knew Bobby Decker can't come out to play because he doesn't have a good coat. So I decided to buy Bobby Decker a coat. I found one. It was a red corduroy one. It looked really warm. It it had a, a hood on it. And, and I decided that that was the coat I was going to buy. And as I brought it up to the front, the lady asked, is this a Christmas present for somebody? And I said, yeah, it is. It's for Bobby. I put my $10 down on the counter and I said, it's for Bobby. And I told her how Bobby desperately needed a warm winter coat. I didn't get any change, he says, but, but uh, she put the coat in the bag, smiled again, and wished me a Merry Christmas. That evening, Grandma helped me package up the coat and we put it in a box and we wrapped it in paper and we put a bow on it as as she was pulling it out of the bag a a tag fell out of it and she grabbed that tag and put it into her bible as we wrapped up the coat and on the outside of it we wrote to bobby from santa claus on the box now grandma said that santa insisted on secrecy right and that for now and forevermore i was one of santa's helpers right and so i went with grandma we parked down the street from bobby's house and we crept up noiselessly and we hid in the bushes just outside of bobby's front door when grandma nudged me and said okay santa claus get out there go do it i ran from my spot in the bushes and and i came up to the to the 
porch and I dropped that box on the porch and I hit the doorbell and ran as fast as I have ever run off of that porch back to the bushes, back by grandma. The author says, you know what, it's been 50 years since those moments and it's still a crystal clear as day as Bobby opened the door and found that gift and opened it to find his winter coat. That night, he says, I realized that grandma was right, that the awful rumors about Santa Claus weren't true, and I still have grandma's Bible, and tucked inside was the price tag for the coat, 1995. Listen, the point of Christmas, the entire point of Christmas, is John 3.16. We all know John 3.16, for God so loved the world, right, that he gave his one and only son and that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But the so what of John 3.16 is 1 John 3.16. And 1 John 3.16 says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. See, because of that gift we received through Jesus Christ and through his life and death, his sacrifice, we are supposed to give a gift of love to others. Okay. Confession time out there for all of you watching. How many people have received a gift and when you got it, you smiled and you said, thank you, but you really didn't like the gift, right? Go ahead, show of hands, didn't like the gift you got. Go ahead, right, we all know. Don't look at the person that gave you the gift, but we all know. Now, how many of you took that gift and after everybody had left, you left it in its original box and you put it maybe on a shelf or in a cupboard or in a drawer and you left it there and you waited for a time when uh, there was a birthday or a, or a wedding or some other event where you needed a gift and you just didn't have the money or didn't have the time and you thought to yourself, oh, you know what, I had that thing that I didn't really like and you wrapped it up and you gave it away, right? Have you ever done that? If so, you're a re-gifter. You're a re-gifter. Here's the thing. Guess what the whole point of love is? The whole point of Christmas is re-gifting. That's the whole point. And the words of that verse that stick in my head so deeply is that if we accept God's love for us, right, then our reaction is to love others. And it says, if someone has enough money to live well, that's me. That's probably you. And he sees a brother and sister in need, but he shows no compassion. How can God's love be in that person? Listen, a world away from here, there's a speck of a place in India that I didn't know existed. There's a man named John that I didn't know existed. There's others that need our help. And this Advent season, we are going to re-gift through Advent Conspiracy and through Aslan to make a difference in the lives of those people. We're going to give generously because God has generously given to us. You wanna know why? Because a person's a person, no matter how small. Father God, I thank you for the way that you have loved me, provided for me, and given me such wonderful gifts in my life. God, I pray for me and for all my friends watching this, God, that we would understand that there are people that we just don't think about, places in the world like Lebanon or Jordan or India or places in Africa or, or South America, God, where there are real people who are real followers of Jesus Christ. And even though we've never heard or, or known them, God, we have an opportunity to give the gift of love to them through our friends at Aslan. God, I pray that we would move in a way that shows our compassion for everyone. God, we pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.